This is a video about post-operative management of blood glucose levels in adults with diabetes and stress hyperglycemia. This video will review the treatment of hyperglycemia. This is a video for medical professionals caring for post-operative adult patients with diabetes or stress hyperglycemia on surgical wards. This is an educational video and is not meant to replace clinical judgment. This video will teach you about the most common medications used to treat diabetes, which medications can and can't be used in postoperative adult patients. This presentation does not apply to patients in the intensive care, patients with post-transplant diabetes, patients on high doses of steroids, patients receiving total parenteral nutrition or enteral tube feeds. These are some of the most common non-insulin-based medications used to treat hyperglycemia. Metformin is a common first-line agent for diabetes. It enhances endogenous insulin sensitivity, but can cause gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea. Metformin can be combined with many other diabetes medications but it cannot be used in acute or chronic renal failure since doing so increases the risk of lactic acidosis. Sulfonylureas such as glyburide and glycoside are secretagogues. They work by increasing endogenous insulin secretion from the pancreas. Those without functional pancreatic beta cells such as those with type 1 diabetes cannot take sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas can cause hypoglycemia and weight gain. Glucagon-like peptide receptor agonists, or GLP-1 agonists, mimic the body's incretin hormones. Incretins are gut hormones that are secreted from the enteroendocrine cells into the blood within minutes after eating. Incretins can increase endogenous insulin secretion, enhance insulin sensitivity in the body, slow gastric emptying, and decrease appetite. GLP-1 agonists are administered subcutaneously daily or once weekly, though an oral formulation was recently approved. They are a desirable treatment option for many patients with type 2 diabetes because they lower blood sugars and promote significant weight loss. In fact, some GLP-1 agonists are approved solely for the treatment of obesity. Finally, GLP-1 agonists are cardioprotective, which is vital since cardiovascular disease is the primary cause of morbidity and mortality in those with diabetes. DPP-4 stands for the enzyme dipeptidyl peptidase 4. DPP-4 plays a major role in glucose metabolism. It is responsible for the degradation of incretins such as GLP-1. Medications that inhibit DPP-4 improve blood sugars by increasing insulin sensitivity and insulin release from the pancreas and slowing gastric emptying. DPP-4 inhibitors are usually well tolerated, although they can cause nausea. DPP-4 inhibitors do not cause hypoglycemia, which is a problem with other medications such as, such as insulin and sulfonylureas, and one of them, linagliptin, can be used in those with renal failure. Sodium glucose cotransporter 2, or SGLT2 inhibitors, are a class of medications that alter kidney physiology. Specifically, they act by inhibiting the sodium glucose transport protein 2, channel located on the proximal tubule of the nephron, which is responsible for reabsorbing 80 to 90% of the glucose filtered by the kidney's glomerulus. Consequently, SGLT2 inhibitors promote the renal excretion of glucose. SGLT2 inhibitors also promote weight loss and are both cardio and renal protective, making them an attractive treatment option for those with cardiac disease or diabetic nephropathy. They also have a diuretic effect which can help lower blood pressure, but can cause polyuria. Most importantly, SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with a severe complication called euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which can occur during illness or other physiologic stressful states, such as during surgery. Insulin is the best way to treat hyperglycemia in the inpatient setting, particularly during the immediate postoperative period when patients are recovering from the significant physiologic stress of surgery and may not be eating well. Non-insulin-based medications should not be used in patients who are 
not eating, are dehydrated with renal failure, are receiving enteral or parenteral nutrition, which are all considerations in the postoperative population. This is why most guidelines recommend that non-insulin treatments be stopped immediately before and after surgery and that insulin be used instead to treat hyperglycemia. Also, people with type 1 diabetes must receive insulin throughout their entire hospital admission. There are many different brands of insulin, but they can be broadly grouped into basal and bolus preparations. Basal insulin is a long-acting insulin used to maintain normal blood sugars during periods of fasting, such as overnight. It is given once or twice a day. Bolus insulin is a rapid-acting insulin given immediately before each meal. Bolus insulin is designed to handle the rise in blood sugars immediately after a meal. The best way to prescribe insulin to inpatients is to use a basal bolus, which is also called a multiple daily injection insulin regimen. This consists of one injection of long-acting basal insulin and an injection of short-acting bolus insulin with each meal. If the patient is not eating or is NPO, then that dose of bolus insulin may be omitted. Except for minor surgery, all non-insulin medications should be stopped before surgery. Metformin, sulfonylureas, and DPP-4 inhibitors can be held on the morning of surgery. Because of the risk of euglycemic DKA, SGLT2 inhibitors should be held 72 hours before surgery, and GLP-1 agonists can be held 24 hours before surgery. A basal bolus subcutaneous insulin regimen is the best way to treat hyperglycemia in the immediate postoperative setting, and many hospitals have specific basal bolus insulin order sets. Non-insulin based medications are gradually resumed as the patient recovers. Metformin, sulfonylureas, and DPP-4 inhibitors can be restarted once the patient is tolerating a full diabetic diet. Because of the risk of euglycemic DKA, SGLT2 inhibitors should not be prescribed in the hospital. Patients can resume their SGLT2 inhibitors as well as GLP-1 agonists after they are discharged from the hospital. Hopefully, this video has taught you about the most common medications used to treat diabetes, which medications can and can't be used in postoperative adult patients.